Hello there, welcome back to coverage here of Mythic Championship 2 from London. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, that's Paul Cheon. Thanks so much for coming along. We're in the modern portion now, Paul. You and I get a little little bite of the apple here on the uh, constructed action. We covered the draft earlier. Boy, that was tough. Brand new set. Oh, yeah. The players are figuring it out. We're figuring it out. But here, the old standby, modern. The oldest format that we play at this level. And uh, we're going to settle right into Yuya Watanabe from Team Musashi. He's playing Tron up against Marcelino Freeman. Uh, from Team Magic Sur on the Boggy Boys, Boggles. Boggles, we get to see a little bit of Boggles here. With, and uh, this is just kind of a classic matchup and not a whole lot's changed for either of these decks, you know. The Tron deck just trying to hit Tron, turn three, mulligan aggressively until you get there. It is the deck that probably got the biggest boost mm. from the... Uh, you know, addition of the London Mulligan uh, because you do get to look at additional cards to make sure that you get the pieces that you're looking for. And it looks like Yuya has turn three Tron and Marcelino doesn't even have a play here on turn one. What? This is not how this is supposed to work for Marcelino, especially given this, uh, the London Mulligan. You'd think that you'd almost never have an opening hand that didn't have a Slippery Bogle or something similar to kick things off, but that does seem to be the case here in game number one. He, uh, I, I mean, I'm guessing that he probably has a core Spirit Dancer in your hand because you simply cannot keep a hand that does not have one of your one-mana Hexproof creatures or the core Spirit Dancer. What about Dryad Arbor? Yeah, I mean, that's extremely slow, and given that you know what you're playing against, I think you do need to be a little more aggressive with your mulligans. I mean, he can still get the Dryad Arbor here, but I will be shocked if he doesn't play a core Spirit Dancer this turn. Looks like he was setting up for next turn. So it's Glade Cover Scout and Hyena Umbra instead. I mean, he's doing it now. Yeah, but I mean... I would, I would guess that this, he drew the scout this turn because, of course, you want to play something right away. But look at this. Turn three Tron and Worm Coil Engine uh, from, from Yuya. And uh, this is going to be very tough. I think this is a matchup that favors Tron because the Boggles deck doesn't have a lot of ways to interact with the Tron's mana base, especially game one. And, you know, cards like Oblivion Stone and Ugin just go so far in this match. Even a card like Worm Coil Engine, if you're not playing Path to Exile main deck, then you're just not going to be able to really deal with Worm Coil. Yeah, the it's interesting because Marcelino does have outs to overcome the Worm Coil Engine here, right? right? It's, it's actually not that difficult for him to get one of these, in this case, the Glade Cover Scout, not only big enough, but also first strikey enough so that it can't, you know, relevantly interact in right. combat. So he, I mean, it's kind of weird to say, but he might be able to ignore or deal with the, uh, the worm coil. But boy, there's other cards that he has to deal with. You mentioned it, really, public enemy number one for him. Uh, well, there's probably two. Ugin the Spirit Dragon is a problem. U Ugin is the absolute best card <laughs> in the matchup, as it exiles problem. all the permanents. Yes. Meaning, even if you put an Umbra on one of your creatures, it will not save the creature, as it just simply exiles all of them. Whereas, something like an Oblivion Stone, if you do have an Umbra, it might be able to, it can, it can save your creature. But, um, yeah, uh, I mean, if anything, with the Ancient Stirrings, I mean, Yuya Watanabe is still able to block the Glade Cover Scout for a few turns. Yep. But yes, currently the Glade Cover Scout is a 4-4 with the Hyena Umbra and the Ethereal Armor. But the moment that he plays another aura that gives plus one, plus one, the Glade Cover Scout will be a 6-6 six, six at the very least next turn. And he has the, the big boy. Oh, oh. So I was going to say, he's, there's good news for Marcelino. He has Daybreak Coronet in hand. But as we saw, Ancient Stirrings just found exactly <laughs> what Yuya Watanabe wants to see here. He found a... Uh, an Oblivion Stone. And I like I really like this attack from Yuya because he knows that it's ex incredibly likely for Marcelino to play an aura this turn to make it so that the Glade Cover Scout will be too big to actually trade with the Worm Coil Engine. So instead, Yuya opting to attack and gain the life here instead. He even got a chump block out of it, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. Aggressive chump block here from Marcelino Freeman, but he's just going to go ahead and run out the Daybreak Cornet, get it while the getting's good. Now, Oblivion Stone interesting here as well, and Yuya says, okay, sure. So the Glade Cover Scout is, I believe, an 8-8 here. The Cornet giving 3, the Umbra giving 1, and the Armor giving 3 because there are 3 enchantments on the battlefield. And then, of course, the 1 base power as right. well. So the big hit here for Marcelino Freeman. But now a fake but counter the, the, the on the Worm Coil engine. The fun engine. ends here, yeah.
So Marcelino now staring down an oblivion stone. And what does he even do from here? I mean, it's, he he's going to need to He can use the Umber to save the Glade Cover Scout. That's fine. But doesn't leave him much. Yeah. I mean, he's going to lose everything else? He will lose everything else, and he will have a 1-1 one, one in play. <laughs> uh, he will also have the Dryad Arbor in play. The Oblivion Stone, I believe, kills non-land permanents. You are correct. Yeah, it doesn't stipulate creatures, in which case it would have died, but non-land. So... But All right, Dryad <laughs> Arbor against Worm Coil Engine. How do yeah, you feel about I guess. that matchup? Uh, yeah, so, you know, Marcelino has one card in hand, and he gets a crack that Horizon Canopy for another card. If he can maybe string together another, something like Rancor plus, plus another Daybreak Cornet, maybe. But that's also just hoping that Yuya has basically nothing in hand. So Yuya can choose to just pop the O-Stone just to get in for an attack this turn, and that is what he chooses to do here. So Every that, that's a cool 3-for-1, thank you. Easy 3-for-1, and Worm Call Engine also gets in. Yeah, you might as well get rowdy, says Yuya Watanabe. Why get cute here? Let's just get busy. In comes Worm Coil. And the real problem here for Marcelino is that he's got one card left in hand plus the Horizon Canopy. He needs to be able to build back up effectively to where he was before. That's going to take three to four cards. And he needs to be able to try to outrace this Worm Coil engine. Yeah, so he needs, he needs something like an Aura plus Daybreak Coronet to maybe try to come back here. Right, and then maybe another Aura the next turn, something like that. Instead, it's, mm. what, hit you for three? Yeah, I mean, th that is the nature of this deck, you know, it just kind of is all in on this one creature, and if you have any type of sweeper effect, especially something that kills all your enchantments, you're in a ton of trouble. Oh boy, Ooh. it's not getting any better here uh, for Marcelino Freeman either, because Yu Watanabe is now coming in with the big hitters. He just threw Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, off the top of the library. Does he have the mana to cast it just yet? He has one short here mm -hmm. He can uh, to cast it this turn, but he can play it next turn as he has access to no. all of the mana here. That'd be GG mana. as well. There's no way that Freeman can come back from that. No, no. I don't think he can come back from where he's at right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's going to take a lot of auras right. to attack through a 10-10 indestructible creature. Like you said, I mean, it can get out of hand quickly. <laughs> Maria just walked by the booth. She's dancing. I, I don't think she took a quick look, though, at what the board <laughs> state was. I don't think she'll be dancing no. after taking a look at who's winning she, this She game. was happy to see her Boggy Boys in the future match area. She is not going to be happy to see what Yuya Watanabe has done to them. Right. And, and keep in mind, there's also a Sanctum of Ugin on the battlefield, so Yuya can sacrifice the Sanctum of Ugin to Get fetch another, another large, large creature, Walking Ballista, to maybe try to finish the game. Just to save him the time at this point. It is academic. Yuya Watanabe, thanks to Oblivion Stone. And Utama getting in there here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to yeah, do it. Marcelino no is going to go ahead and scoop up. The, he's got a smile on his face like, well, I didn't go very well. Well, that's the one thing. When you play the Boggles deck, you're just like, well... There's nothing I could have done, because really, there's not a whole lot you do. Maybe you, you just feel fine about your life yeah, the whole like day. You're like, what was I supposed to do? All right, yeah. well, we'll let you figure out what Marcelino is supposed to do. We've got a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll have more live from London. We'll see you in just a bit. Rich Hagen, Frank Carsten here with another mini debt tech. This time, it is Titan Shift. Is it mono green, Frank? Uh, well, you, you might uh, think that, but uh, these cards quite often search for uh, mountains, actually. Right. So Titan Shift runs uh, a whole lot of cards, could be around 45 even, give or take, that are either lands or cards that put lands in play, and, and those you see over, uh, over here. When you're playing the deck, it, uh, it can almost feel like every single card you draw is a mountain, somehow. All right, so we're, we're finding our mountains for the most part. Mm -hmm. Here's phase two. Yeah, Velikut, the Molten Pinnacle, is uh, the key card in the deck and, well, the payoff for finding so many mountains. It's why we sometimes even call the deck Red Green Velikut. The, the way to find Velikut is, well, Primeval Titan. It definitely helps to uh, get it onto the battlefield. And then afterwards, Primeval Titan attacks, fetches two mountains, gives you two more Velikut triggers, and that allows you to either control the board or start to uh, burn out your opponent. Important note, if you're new to modern, 
the words Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, you might be tempted to think, oh, that would be a legendary land, which of course would make it a terrible deck. But no, you can have Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, and Valakut the Molten Pinnacle. Indeed, yeah. Sometimes you have uh, four on the battlefield and every mountain you play is uh, 12 damage. All right. Um, the, the key plan of the deck is actually to ramp into seven lands and then cast Cape Shift. You would find Valakut and six mountains. And since every mountain that is entering the battlefield then sees five other mountains, you would get to roast the opponent for 18 damage. Uh, so when playing against Velikut, remember that there's a huge difference between 18 and 19 life. Don't just shock yourself uh, for no reason. All right, so Titan Shift, Velikut, the Molten Pinnacle. Learning a lot today about modern from uh, from Frank. Lots of cool little interactions. Let's take a look at one of our back tables here. We're on Ross Miriam with Is It Phoenix, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the more popular decks in the field, uh, versus Yuki Ichikawa from Japan from Team Musashi. Yuki's on um, humans. Yeah, and uh, you know I think this is a relatively close matchup. Um, Looks like we really kind of blew it here. <laughs> <laughs> Shuffle cam. <laughs> I was so excited too. Yeah, and you know that is one of the, you know, every time you do have two decks with a good amount of interaction with a clock, you know, uh, you will have, you will have very close competitive games where all your cards are basically relevant. Let's take a. I, I've got some updates in front of me on the screen. By the way, welcome back to the booth. Uh, so. Yuya Watanabe uh, picked up game one. We saw that one on camera. And then we were going to check in on Yuki Chikawa and Ross Merriam, but the game ended too quickly. That was Ross Merriam picking up game number one with Is It Phoenix. And then our other table has Brian Brandouin and Noah Walker on it. Uh, they're both sitting at five and one, by the way, so not too shabby. That was BBD picking up game number one, Humans. And uh, Noah decided to bring Grixis Shadow to the battlefield here. Uh, we do have one other uh, match, but that is our time walk match, and so I've asked that we don't get updated on that because <laughs> we we like to we want to know just like the same time as you do. Right. You know, the, I, I can't fake it. Like if I know what it is, I'm just like, well, you know. right, yeah, and and the, <laughs> there's a nice deck in there too. Let me just say, yeah, well, I, I some did definition of nice. We'll see. We'll see. I, I think it's, so. The, the matchup I will tell you is burn fine versus black red prison. Fun Police is in full effect. We looked at the deck list and we're just like, wow. Basically, all the unfun cards in Modern well, are probably in this Yeah, deck. But, but it was also like, I got kind of schooled because I'm like, Paul, what does this deck do? And he gave me this like three minute spiel and he's like, I just made all that up. <laughs> I'm like, what? But it was probably right. But it right? was probably, but yeah. I have no idea. He's like, why are all these cards in here? And I just. <laughs> he just started rattling off. Like, oh, well, you want to do this to do this. And it was, it was probably hey, true. Part, part of the coverage, sometimes you just got to make stuff up on the fly, That's you know? Right. Especially you gotta, in you, gotta, you gotta adjust, you know, Bob and Weave. So. That's right. Well, I bought it. I was in. I was like, wow, Paul's on top of this stuff, yeah. man. He gets it. But yeah, Black Red Prison is a deck that uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see uh, out, of, out of Time Lock. Although, I will say, uh, Burn sitting across. By the way, that's Scott Alter playing the, the Prison deck. And uh, Yoshitsugu Aoki from Japan on Burn. So again, that that is our Time Lock match, and we don't want to give you too much uh, information about that, and I really don't want too much information about it either. But we're going to sideboards now, and uh, things really interesting down in the feature match here. I was actually just down there uh, doing the the spotter. That that's the role that we have on the coverage team for uh, inputting the player's hands. You see Riley right there. He's he took my spot there, and that's BJ over on the left. These guys are of course doing great work for us, keeping us up to date. That's how we're able to get the hands on your screen for you is they punch them in manually. So you got to know all the cards. Oh yeah, their favorite decks to cover <laughs> are uh, Dredge. Yeah, and Dredge. Back, back when it was a little more popular, I believe Hollow One was also a very... Hollow One uh, was the not the absolute <laughs> worst, but on the Hall of Fame for Goblin worst. Lore, what happened? Yeah, and you're just like, oh, come on. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I did, uh, I had Humans, no problem, right. real easy. Easy game. Then Humans again, I'm like, this is the best, no problem at all. Um, but then there was an Is It Phoenix, mm. and they see a lot of cards. Right, like for sure. They have a hand by the they pass their turn. They pass their turn by the time it comes back to them, they could have cast two or three cantrips. You're you're just kind of moving through all of it. But in the meantime, looks like players are taking a look at their openers. Uh, a quick reminder: we are using the London Mulligan rule here. Why don't you tell people what that is, real quick? 
So the London Mulligan is a new mulligan that we are trying out for this tournament only currently. Uh, so far the reception has been pretty good, but basically if you mulligan, you get to look at another seven card hand and then you get to put a number of cards back uh, on the bottom of your library equal to the number of mulligans that you've taken. So for example, if you mulligan once, you get to look at another seven card hand and then you choose one card and put that onto the bottom. So this is a stronger mulligan than the one that we've been using, um, the Vancouver mulligan where you mulligan and then you scry because you get more information. You get to look at that extra card before making that decision. So, you know, a, a lot of talk has been going into specifically modern where, hey, there are certain decks that really look for you know, very highly specific cards, right? You're not talking about standard where you're just, you know, playing a bunch of good cards. Oftentimes you're just looking for very specific cards. So, you know, coming into this tournament, I think there have been some risers mm -hmm. where, you know, Tr Tron. Sure, yeah, Tron. Mm -hmm. Some decks were fine, but, you know, decks like Tron, uh, Tron, I think it was the biggest riser coming into this event because, of course, all you need is Tron plus a big card in your hand, and oftentimes that will be enough to win matches. That's right. By the way, you overwhelmed Marcelino with your knowledge here, Paul, and he ran away from the feature match area <laughs> to go take notes. Uh, he'll be right back, though, so we're going to pop over to Brian Brown, Dewan, and Noah Walker and see what they're up to. I mentioned this is Humans versus Grixis Shadow, and it looks like Noah Walker's doing Noah Walker stuff. Look at that graveyard. <laughs> on one side of the battlefield, it's land one drop. On the other side, it's two lands and five cards in the yard already. Thank you very much. Just cruising right through that. Yeah, that is typically what this Grixis Shadow deck can do with yeah. those Thought Scours. I've been turned to Gourmet Ang Angler often enough yes. to know that this... Uh, it's it, not even special. You yeah, know, it like just happens. That, it just happens a lot. Yeah, right. it, it is just sort of what this deck is designed to do, that type of thing. And Noah is very much an expert with this deck, by the way. He's had good success with it, so I'm not surprised to see it in his hands here. I saw it. He has an Engineered Explosives in his hand as well as a Liliana, the Last Hope, one of my favorite cards in Modern. He does. However, Brian does have a Thalia in play, meaning that all those cards are going to take Awkward. a little bit longer to go yeah. off. And Noah Walker just, just kind of the Grixis mage because he's also known to be kind of a, a you know, a legacy Grixis master. You know, every time you see him, he's basically just playing with scalding tarns and either shock lands or dual lands uh, in this color combination. So he's very, very familiar with a deck, you know, full of cheap cantrips. So what is happening right here? We see that Noah Walker has sacrificed his Scalding Tarn. Is this perhaps with the uh, Thalia on the stack? It is very possible, especially if he's looking to play the Steam Vents here untapped. That was end step. So okay. BBD just passed the turn? Huh. Okay, so, I mean, Noah just getting to a low enough life total because, of course, you are playing Grixix Shadow, so you want to get low enough so that you can actually <laughs> play <laughs> one of those. So to, BBD to is not attacking to try to prevent him from doing that? Right. He's like, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to wait. I'm going to wait. I love BBD, man. He's so great. And there's a really key cyborg card here for the humans deck that's kind of swung the matchup around. You know, game one might be a little bit tougher, but after cyborg, oftentimes these human decks play three to four copies of Oriok Champion, which is a creature that has both protection from black and red. So the Grixis Shadow deck just can't kill it. And then it just does a really good job of just brick walling both the Death Shadow and the Gurmag Angler. And it kind of forces your opponents to have the combination of Death Shadow plus Team or Battle Rage to actually try to put the games away. That sounds really annoying. Right, for sure, <laughs> definitely. When you're like, I have an 10-10 you know, yeah, like, for one yeah, man, block. and they're like, cool, block yeah. it. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, and there's also just a good amount of ways to, you know, buy time to get, you know, cards like Death Shadow and Gurmag Angle off the battlefield because four copies of Reflector Mage. Reflector Mage does so much work here um, when you're just trying to do everything you can to play either Death Shadow or Gurmag Angle. So what happened here? Because check this out. He somehow, some way, has Internet Explosives on one even with Thalia on the battlefield. Is it just the extra cost that you can pay whatever color you want? Well, you can just announce Engineered Explosives for zero. Right. And then you have to, of course, pay one mana for the Thalia. Of course. And all Engineered Explosives says is it's a sunburst. Whatever colored mana you yeah. use to cast this card, that's how many counters it's going to come, come onto the battlefield with. Yeah, it's really cool. You can actually use that trick to even get an additional color into it sometimes. Yes. Than you, uh, and, and still have it be the right number, but... Yeah, in this case, it's just going to be for one, and that's a nice little play there from Noah Walker. Of course, he's played this matchup a lot, and he can use this to uh, to take out the champion of the parish. Yeah, but this which is, is exactly what he does. Still awkward for him, though. 
right? And BBD still Ooh. not attacking here. Yeah, but man, if he has land though and can cast, oh, he didn't have it. I was going to say land in Liliana would have been really nice here. Take out that lieutenant. Right. Are we supposed to say lieutenant now that we're in England? I am no, not right. sure. I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> I'm going to say lieutenant then. Okay, same. St stay on plan. I was, I was kind of hoping that's what you were going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So, Brian, you know, with an okay start here, but really looking for land number three, you know, that is kind of one of the, one of the <coughs> things that I've noticed with this deck is if you don't have one of your one drops that kind of generate you mana cards like the Noble Hierarch or Aether Vial, mm -hmm. sometimes you get out, you're, you're a little bit clunky because, and a lot of your power is, are in your three mana cards, cards like Mantis Rider, Reflector Mage, and, you know, sometimes even cards like Militia Bugler. Oh, but he does find a land, and look at look this. Look at this, wow, what a turn here for Brian Brandoon. Goes champion of the Parish, and then follows it up with the Lieutenant. And this is going to be a problem here for Noah. He does have at least Fatal Push in his hand, I just saw. Uh, and he can cast that here to deal with one of these threats. But it is going to get out of hand quickly. Yeah, I imagine he's going to use the Fatal Push on the Thali here because it's really putting, it's really taxing his mana here. Sure. And at this point now, Brian has to figure out, okay, is this the turn to attack? Because he hasn't been attacking with his creatures. Noah Walker's at 14, meaning he cannot play a Death Shadow. You need to be at at least 12 before you can run out of 1-1 one, one Death Shadow. So is BBD really just trying to one-shot him? That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just being very, very careful here. This, does, this might also tell Noah that he might not have an actual answer to Death Shadow, mm -hmm. right? He might not have something like a Reflector Mage in hand because he's being so conservative yeah. uh, with, with his attacks here on Noah. Now, this is interesting as well because another card that Noah has in his hand, he has a second copy of Engineered Explosives. So... And look, yeah, BBD's passing oh, again. Look, look at this restraint here. So Noah could use this to kill Thalia right now, and especially if he finds a land next turn, take out both of the lieutenants. Oh, he found Liliana of the Veil, vale, and he has that Liliana the Last Open in his hand as well. So very removal heavy here for Noah Walker. He's just going to pass a turn back once again, though. Patient, yeah. patient here from Noah. Yeah, both players yeah, showing. Yeah, really a patient from BBD. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't attacked him. Right. What is going on? In Noah's hand, it, you know, he, he's got a lot of those removal spells, but kind of slow, you know, two Lilianas and the explosives. He really wanted to find that land number two, like you were talking about, to be able to get both of those Thalia's lieutenants off the battlefield. It's Lieutenant Paul. You just told me that. You're, you're, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to think anymore, Marshall. When in Rome. Okay, fine. We're not. We're not in. Rome. <laughs> okay, then this lieutenant. Right, okay, fine. <laughs> Is now the turn to attack? Maybe so. There's a Manus Rider. I mean, I think is this a lethal attack? This looks like this is 5, 9, 11, 14. This is an attack for 14. So now but, might be the turn to But this to is attack. interesting, right? Because right. if he attacks and it doesn't work, does he just set up Noah to be like, here's a bunch of uh, Death Shadows? Yeah, I mean, that is a possibility. But the question is, if Noah just has something like one removal spell here, he's still going to take a ton of damage. Yeah. And Brian might have a lethal attack next turn. Please say BBD just pass the turn back. I again. think he did. That I, I, I saw I the saw hand motion. The flippant hand wave. It looks like Snapcaster Mage for Fatal Push is the plan here for Walker. God, BBD. Yeah. He's playing human control. Human control. And you know, Noah actually has a Death Shadow in hand, which is which is just pretty insane it here. It really is awesome here from BBD and from Noah, honestly. Right. I still like Noah's position here. Given what we know he has in his hand, he can really kind of put a hurting on this board. And BBD having waited, oh, there was land number four. And that was huge because it's specifically a fetch land. So now oh. Noah can control his life total to actually play the Death Shadow that he has in hand while also having the ability to play that engineered explosives for two to get both of those lieutenants off the battlefield. Yeah, that would leave just the Mantis Rider. And we know that he has two good answers for it. One great answer if it's the only creature on the battlefield he can use Liliana of the Veil vale to kill it. But even if it, if it isn't, he can use Liliana, the last hope, to really mitigate it a lot, you know, bring it down to just one point per turn. Bad draw here from BBD. Yeah, but it looks like Brian does have another Mantis Rider. Maybe now, is just, now at this point he doesn't really need to not attack anymore, right? Because Noah does have the Scalding Tarn on the battlefield, so mm -hmm. maybe now is the time for him to go for it here. Because Noah will be able to play a Death Shadow, at least a 2-2 two -two Death Shadow, if he does use the Scalding Tarn to fetch and get a Shock Land, go down to 11 life. 
pace of play in this this match is not blazingly <laughs> quick, but you know how it is in in modern. Uh, the de the decisions are compressed compared to something like limited or standard, where one mistake can often kill you. And games, you know, they'll go to turn four, five, six sometimes, but sometimes they end even earlier than that. And here we go. Finally, an attack from BBD. He says, I'm sending these ones in and forcing the issue. Noah Walker says, I'll block and take the rest. Right. Uh, Noah is so patient here, really leveraging it, forcing it so that BBD can't really cast another two drop here. Lest it die. Yeah, and Noah at this point just making it, yeah, like you said, uh, so that Brian doesn't run out another two mana threat here. And Noah. Which he has, by right, the way. Exactly. And Noah can now choose to either shock. Or just get a basic at this point, and he would still have a comfortable 5-5 Death Shadow in play while, you know, kind of preserving his life total. But it looks like he's he's uh, going as low as he can get. I love it. He's down to six, and he cracks the engineered explosives. This is the turn. This is it. This is the turn when BBD finally attacked, and when Noah finally found the mana to get the two-for-one off the battlefield. Now, the question is, what happens from here? First things first, Liliana of the Veil vale to take care of Mantis Rider. See you later. And there it is, the big turn for Noah Walker. Now, what can BB do, BBD do to strike back? We know he has the Manus Rider. That would take half of Noah's life total or Liliana Vale out of the equation. Yeah, and this is a fascinating game because, you know, Brian really committed to the line of not attacking Noah and just trying to get in for one giant attack. But that gave Noah all the time in the world to set up this, you know, these sequence of plays where he was able to play a removal spell every turn and then eventually get to the fourth land, find his fetch land to use explosives to clear the way. And then now he still has the ability to just finish the game in one attack with the Death Shadow if he has something like a team or battle rage. Yeah, I joked earlier that BBD was playing human's control, but the truth is Noah is playing the control deck here. I mean, look at the card. If I just told you, here's the spells he's cast, right? Two copies of Engineering Explosives, Fatal Push, Snapcaster Mage, you'd say like, oh, what is he playing like a... A Grixis control deck, and the answer is kind of post board. <laughs> he is, you know. Now Liliana the Veil as well is going to tick up. Oh, and Brian is setting up for a, a, a lethal attack here. However, his hand is Mantis Rider and Phantasmal Image. There is a Ooh. there is an Ether Vial in play yes. that's going to tick up to two. So what Brian can do is play Mantis Rider. Then Vial in, Phantasmal Image, copying the Mantis Rider for a lethal attack. And I think he's going to get it here. Is he going to get yeah, there? Yeah, because that was no one tapped Liliana out. the last half, and he's completely tapped out. BBD, has he set up the win? It looks like it from here. Down to six, it would be an exactly oh lethal goodness. attack. Look and you see this. how quickly he put that up. And here we go. One, two, three. Take wow. one damage. Mantis Rider. And you know what's better than one Mantis Rider? Two Mantis oh. Riders kill you. And that's going to do it. Jeez. BBD takes the game and the match. And look at that. He's calm, cool, and collected. He says, it's just what I do, bro. <laughs> Let's get back to our main table here. They've been waiting for us for a while, but we could not leave that one. No oh, way. And keep in mind, if you looked at Noah's hand, he had a dismember in his hand, uh, right? You know, there could have been a scenario where he just keeps up a bunch of mana with dismember and just try to end the game with the, yes. the Death Shadow instead. So, I mean, that, that was... That was a game. That was, that was a, a game. heck of a game. Really one of the only ways he could lose there. Let's get into game number two, though. Yuya Watanabe with Tron early in the game, in game number one, and he picked up a quick victory. On the other side of the table, it's Marcelino Freeman, who had a pretty clunky draw, uh, given the mulligan and such, from uh, the mulligan rule uh, from the Boggles deck. Let's see if he can get off to a, a better start here. And take a, take a look at Watanabe's hand. He actually, you know, oftentimes with Tron, you want to be mulliganing aggressively so that you have the opportunity to go turn three Tron, but he doesn't have another Tron piece here. Sure, he has an Ancient Stirrings to help find one of the pieces, but he has a very, very important sideboard card in his hand here. As you can see, there is a Ratchet Bomb oh, yeah. in Yuya Watanabe's hand, and that card is phenomenal in this matchup. Ratchet Bomb and Oblivion Stone. Good luck, Marcelino Freeman. That is going to be very difficult to beat. Another Ratchet Bomb off the top of the library as well, Paul, so he's got backup plans for his backup plans. And this is going to get perhaps a bit ugly here from Marcelino Freeman's perspective. Ancient Stirrings, did he make green? He probably did. He's, he's Yuya. Yeah, you always, yeah, you always add green. Uh, he does, however, have the core spirit dancer in play, meaning mm -hmm. that he won't be down on cards. And he can put the auras on the core spirit dancer so that the Ratchet Bomb needs to go up to two mm -hmm. if he does want to get that off the battlefield. And 
That's exactly what's going to happen here. You Watanabe says, you know what? I'm not going to bother with this ancient strength. I need to get this ratchet bomb on the table right now. Right. And he's right. This is the big turn. We're going to get a lot of damage in here. Yeah, a lot of damage and kind of for free because he gets a card off of each one. But so a that's huge ranker. draw for Marcelino. What did he find? Stony Silence. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> that's what he wanted to see. So the damage output is going to be reduced here a bit, but he needs to get that Stony Silence on the battlefield pronto. It looks like he's going to maybe wait. Ooh. Going for damage here. Well, that's interesting because he's casting like... Yuya can just simply audible into destroying the one drops, and that would be quite strong here as well. Yeah, I mean, this is a gigantic attack. Yeah, it's not lethal, though. It is it's not. not even a close. Right. Huh. Huh. Because now Yuya Watanabe has the ability to, if this is not a lethal attack next turn, you know, Yuya can tick up the Ratchet Bomb to one and then sacrifice it to get all those auras off of the Core Spirit Dancer and also deal with the Glade Cover Scout. Right, he kind of gets the Glade Cover Scout for free. Now, we know that this is also free, air quotes, for Freeman because, well, he's getting these cards back each time. So it's not like a complete disaster. Right. But it does give uh, Yuya Watanabe a line of play that allows him to survive for an extra turn where Freeman could have kind of shut him out there. Absolutely. Stony Silence is such an effective card in this matchup. I mean, sure, Yuya is going to bring in three to four copies of Nature's Claim because all Tron decks have it because of cards like Stony Silence. But, you know... It seems like you could have maybe waited, played Stony Silence, and then follow up the follow follow up the next turn with a flurry of auras to get in. But Marcelino just trying to end the game here as quickly as possible. I mean, he did draw two additional cards here. Yuya surveying the scene now. So what Marcelino can do next turn is kind of force the Ratchet Bomb. Sure. He can lead out with Stony Silence, which will force Yuya Watanabe to crack the Ratchet Bomb to get those arrows off the battlefield. And then if that happens, Marcelino will get the Rancor back, which he can then recast onto the Core Spirit Dancer, which would allow him to attack in for five. Ooh. What was that? It's close. He's hit to use oh. six. That's almost <laughs> lethal, buddy. And remember, he'll get a card right. off of it, too. So. so if Marcelino has, for example, land plus another aura, that could get it done. That Windswept Teeth is in the graveyard, right? <clears throat> I, From Freeman. I believe so. Because they can also sneak in a damage with a Dryad Arbor, too. Yes. But I think that he used that one earlier in the game. And these are the kinds of hands... Uh, you know, Yuya, I mean, Marcelino has got to be thrilled that Yuya's second land wasn't just another Tron land. It was forced. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, worst case scenario, Yuya's going to have Tron turn four, which is a huge difference, especially in this matchup where you're basically just racing. Now, this is going actually quite well for Marcelino. I mean, that was Yuya using Ancient Stirrings to find Chromatic Sphere. Right. Like, huh? That's about as close as you get to a miss out so, of the Tron deck. So if Marcelino just finds a land here... There's Stony Silence, so he's going to force the issue right now. And Yuya's going to respond with both the star and the Ratchet Bomb, or I should say the Ratchet Bomb, which kills the star. Yeah, so now Marcelino just needs to draw a land because I think he has another Rancor in hand. Yeah, so there's the Rancor. Draw it. Is it a green mana source? Yeah. Nope. Okay, so we get a turn here from Yuya. But he needs to find an well, answer to... Find? Yeah, he needs to find... I, I just don't think he has anything here. No, it's too right. slow. The, the mana draw for him has been really horrendous. He somehow yeah. got star and, and sphere flooded. Right. It's and a little weird for, for... You don't see this actually happen that often. Right. It's super unlikely to miss with Ancient Stirrings on either mine... On both mine and power plants. Right. Is there anything you can do is a real question here. He is facing a lethal threat. Yeah, oftentimes you can dig through your deck... Uh, with those Chromatic Spheres and Chromatic Stars, but not with the Stony Silence in play. The Boggy Boy's going to strike back here, Paul. We're going to get a Game 3? Oh, yeah, we're getting a Game 3. Wow. What a terrible draw for Yuya and uh, Marcelino capitalizing on it very nicely. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the biggest upsides to playing the Boggles deck 
and Marcelino picking up the victory. One of the biggest upsides of playing the Boggles deck is that you just have access to the best cyborg cards. I think White just has the best, most effective cyborg cards in both Rest in Peace and Stony Silence. And oftentimes, you know, when you're playing a card like Rest in Peace, a lot of decks, it actually hurts them. You know, like most decks use their graveyard in some way, but Boggles deck does not for the most part. So, you know, both of those cards are highly effective and high, you know, especially in the, in, the, in this metagame, right? Where we're talking about both, you know, the, the Arclight Phoenix deck, the Isa Phoenix deck being one of the most popular decks, along with Dredge. And then of course, Stony Silence being very, very effective against both Hardened Scales and Tron. All right, we're gonna take a short commercial break. and We'll be back right after this. And welcome back to the feature match area here in London. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, I'm with Paul Chion, and we're watching a modern action here at Mythic Championship 2. Then in the feature match area, only two left, Marcelino Freeman and Yuya Watanabe, and we are going to game number three. Not a particularly interactive matchup, it's Boggles in the hands of Marcelino, and on the other side of the battlefield, it is Tron, but they have actually been kind of going at it, right? Yeah. We, we've seen cards really affect each other. Not just in the linear, I'm going to get you dead before you do sense, but you know, we saw key main main deck cards from Yu Watanabe win in the first game and uh, kind of a fight over the sideboard cards there with the uh, Ratchet Bomb versus Stony Silence. Marcelino ultimately winning that one in game number two. And look at this turn three Tron again for Yuya Watanabe with that star. So Marcelino must be nice. Really, uh, you know, if he. he he has two copies of Damping Sphere in his sideboard, so really needs to deploy that this turn. Um, you know, Marcelino does have a handful of answers or ways to interact. He has uh, some Damping Spheres, Gadok Teague, uh, Stony Silence as well. But, but again, not a ton. Right. 
There oh, it is. There it is. Damping Sphere here on turn number two and just in time. So Damping Sphere is going to make it so that any lands that, uh, that are tapped for two or more mana produce just colorless instead. It yeah. also has an, an additional tax for if you're trying to cast multiple spells in one turn, which, while isn't necessarily Tron's main game plan, it does actually happen sometimes. Yeah, and this is why, I mean, Damping Sphere has been such a highly effective sideboard card and a, and a card that many decks have in their sideboard because it attacks multiple decks. Not only is Damping Sphere a very strong option against a deck like Tron, but it's also good at slowing down some combo decks. Decks like Storm, for example, which are looking to play multiple spells, you just can't go off if Damping Sphere is on the battlefield. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I remember when I first saw it and I thought, oh boy, we're going to see that in Modern all over the place. Right. And then we kind of didn't for a while, and now I'm like, there it is. You know, <laughs> right, it just right, took right. its time to make it into the sideboards, yeah. but now we actually do see it quite a bit. Yeah, you see it in the sideboard of you know uh, of the Boggles deck. We've seen it in humans. I mean, it, it's it's all over the place. Right. So Oblivion Stone, by the way, on the battlefield now for Watanabe, and that thing looks very good from here as it will take care of the Damping Sphere as well as the board. Yeah, that is the issue. If you want to slow down Tron's mana, you still need to put on a relevant clock. If not, Tron can eventually get back into the game with cards like Oblivion Stone just blowing up the world. And then once you do, then you get to untap and win the game, basically. Yeah. And, you know, it's close. The, you said a relevant clock, right? And that's kind of the dividing line here. And currently, Marcelino does not have that. Right. Right. He's only produced two power. And that is simply just not going to be enough here as Yuya can just take his time, crack this Oblivion Stone, blow up the board, and then just explode the next turn. Right, but, I mean, look at this. He, well, he had, there's a Spider Umbra. He had some, some, some interaction, but sure, Spider Umbra means the Boggle is going to survive, but it's still not going to be a relevant clock. And then once Yuya gets to untap, he's going to basically have... Kind of the world is his oyster, right? right? He can just play whatever he wants. So, you know, if Marcelino doesn't have something like a Stony Silence, maybe a Seal of Primordium, he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, Yu's hand looks pretty darn good here as well. He's got Walking Ballista, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, an Ur another Urza's Tower, and a Dismember. Yeah, and Dismember specifically still in the deck for that core Spirit Dancer that kind of took over game two. All right, there's land number five now for Yuya. So his Oblivion Stone is online. And uh, now Marcelino's just in that, that awkward spot where, yeah, he can get in for three, but there's really no point to adding more. Right. I mean, he will get to save his Slippery Bogle, as you mentioned, thanks to the Umbra, the Totem Armor on that uh, Spider Umbra. But so? Yeah, Yuya's going to untap, and he's going to have access to at least 11 mana. Yeah, I think this one's just about over. Yuya Watanabe... Just using these colorless sweepers, specific, uh, specifically Ooh, Oblivion Stone. No lands for you. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't do it. <laughs> Yuya, come <laughs> on, Ulamog man. Ulamog off the top. And that's going to earn the concession as well. Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hungry, said, hmm, I'm eyeballing those two lands over there. And that's exactly what happened. Boy, Damping Sphere was supposed to do something there, right? It was two turns. Right. Well, th yeah, that's the thing. It, it bought you some time, but Marcelino, you know, when you do bring in these disruptive elements, you are still taking away a little bit from your primary game plan. If for every Damping Sphere that you draw, you're drawing one less relevant aura to put onto your creatures. That's right, and then that gets compounded as well when people say, well, I'm going to mulligan to my key sideboard cards, right. and now all of a sudden they're working with so much less that I've seen it so many times where players go, check this out, I got my rest in peace, and then the other player's like, okay. Right. But then they don't back it up with anything forever, and the player could just simply build out another game. Yeah, player. and that's a, that's a one like super impressive thing about a deck like Tron, where it, super it, resilient. it is very resilient. You think, you know, haha, Blood Moon GG? Yeah. That's just not always no, the case. It's just like, I'll see you in eight turns, and I'll just hard cast this with my mountain. Because people are cyborging in cards so that you can maybe play a fair real game of yes. magic, right? But then you're down a card. Yes. And then they just start using all the redundant cycling effects to just, you know, start hard casting Oblivion Stones or even Worm Coil Engines. And Oftentimes, that's enough to win a lot of games. Yes, it is. All right, we've got Time Walk for you right now, so let's head on down. This is Scott Alter on the right-hand side playing <laughs> oh, Black man. Red Prison. So give us a quick look at uh, what this deck is trying to do here, Paul, because we have not seen one like this in the feature match area uh, today thus far. What are some of the cards that we might see? Uh, so basically, I, I can describe this deck in uh, one word. Is it two words? Anti-fun? 
Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a compound word. That's so, a compound yeah. word. Okay, there you go. But it's it's a black-red prison-style deck. Of course, we're fami- very familiar with the word prison deck that a lot of uh, people have chosen to play. But this is different. It is black and red. It's playing in four copies of Ensnaring Bridge. Everybody's favorite card. Which, which is kind of the, the centerpiece, right? Of course. Mm-hmm. But then it also plays four copies of Chalice of the Void, which you want to get out early. So you, it also plays four copies of Simeon Spirit Guide to be able to get that Chalice of the Void into play. It also plays four copies of Blood Moon. So it really just wants to completely <laughs> hose opponents. Also, three copies of Leyline of the Void in the main, because why not? Wow. Really hoping to mulligan roll into... You know, Leyline of the Void, if okay. you are playing against a deck like Dredge. So it's got a lot of cards that kind of, if I draw this card, I win this matchup. And that's what it's basically trying to do game How, one. how does the game end? So its win conditions are four copies of Goblin Rabble Master. Uh, which is, uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't quite get there, especially with Ensnaring Bridge, but it's got four copies of Goblin Rabble Master, one copy of uh, Hazard the Fervent, and then four copies of Chandra Torch of Defiance, which I think is one of the primary win conditions. Yeah, that's actually really clever with the Rabble Master, right? Because <clears throat> you can just sit there and draw your card for the turn, get in with the token, and then play your land, never get hit back. So it looks like a good start here, though, for Aoki, as he's got a Goblin Guide chipping away as well as Monastery Mentor, and so currently nothing for Scott, who's already down to 11. Like, yeah. Bur- Burn has kind of traditionally been a tough matchup for some of the older versions of the Ensnaring Bridge decks. Because the problem is, sure, you play turn three Ensnaring Bridge, but your hand, you're still just going to have a bunch of cards in your hand. Yeah. Also, what the Burn deck usually does is just play a few one-mana creatures and get in for enough points of burn so that ultimately you can just win with a flurry of actual burn spells. Right. So and Brit, it actually plays right into their game plan. Exactly. exactly. Right. Like they're going to only hit you in the early stages with the creatures anyway. By the time you get bridged down, they've got what they wanted out of them, and now they're going to start going upstairs. Yeah, Blood Moon, not especially effective. But this is one of the absolute best cards. Actually, you know what? This is the best card, Collective rather, Brutality is probably the matchup. best card, yeah, for sure. In this case, it's going to be effectively a three-for-one. He's going to get a chance to kill a creature. I shouldn't say a three for one. He just have to discard two cards. But, you know, the effect of th- worth three cards just built into one, which is really impressive. I mean, this is what you need. You need to do these things in a time frame that actually matters. So he gets to kill a creature, get that drain in there, which is kind of like most of a card, and then actually take away a card from Aoki as well. Yeah, absolutely. Really that was powerful. Huge. One of the... Yeah. Again, for this matchup, the most important card. And now, I mean, there's a Searing Blaze in Aoki's hand, which isn't going to be doing a whole lot. Alter doesn't really have any creatures in his deck outside of Goblin Rabble Master. And then, yeah, he's left with just an Inspiring Vantage and a Monastery Swift Spear. So, hmm. Land off the top as well for Aoki. So maybe actually live here for Scott yeah, Alter. Yeah. It did not look good when we came in. Right. But now all of a sudden he's at 13, facing down one power. That That's is, not that scary. I mean, that is the power of collective brutality. Yeah, really so. helps shore up this burn matchup. So he's going to skewer pre-combat to get that uh, prowess trigger. So this is a five damage turn. Not bad, but right. eight is a long way to go when you don't have anything. Exactly. But Scott does need to find some defenses. That looked like a Simeon... Spirit Guide in hand, but I'm not sure that you want to actually run it out there because Alter does know about Searing Blaze in Aoki's hand. So we'll see what Scott can muster up here. Well, there he is. Okay. Basically, the quickest possible clock. Right. He right? wants to just I mean, end the game. Yes. And, and, and Rabble Master is an absurdly fast clock. I mean, I think that's the fastest clock you can get for three mana. Absolutely. However, if Aoki just draws... I, I mean, he's in such a good spot here because if he draws a burn spell, he can kill the Rabble Master and attack. Yes. But if he draws a land, the Searing Blaze is going to be so, so strong here. He's going to get that Rabble Master off the battlefield and get in for five points of damage. So he wants to draw a land or a spell? That's a pretty good spot to be in, I would say. <laughs> I, don't, right? I don't hate it. I don't hate it. <laughs> I didn't see what he drew, but it wasn't a land. So now I can see Aoki just choosing to attack mm. and, and putting Scott to the test. Do you want to block? Because Aoki can also just fire off Searing Blaze. It um, was Lightning Bolt, by the way, off the top of the library. He's going to use it proactively to take down the Rabble Master and get in for two. That puts Scott down to five. 
theoretically. So now if Aoki draws a land, Searing Blaze will... <laughs> <laughs> Simeon Spirit Guide hard cast. You want to keep that creature way. back. You want to keep that creature back. You know yes. about the Searing Blaze in Aoki's hand. If Aoki draws a land, he needs to have had that yeah. creature back you to know, block and not die. That could have been Scott in autopilot just thinking I have to attack with my goblin. But uh, no, you did not. And it went in the red zone. And this is could be over. Well, no. It looks like block. first things first. The entire deck is three damage burn spells. Yeah, you have yeah, to block. You just can't not. I mean, you, you're really not in a position to let Aoki get in free damage here, so. Oof. That's a skull crack from Aoki. Yeah. Bringing Scott yep. down to two and, you know. Clearing the board Scott away. Scott needs a collective brutality here. I think that's like the only card here because, yeah, it, land or spell is good here. Well, there it is. He okay. gets in and then in Snaring Bridge, so no more attacks here. <laughs> Land or Bird spell, spell, still good. Yeah. And there it is, there it Lightning is. Bolt off the top for Aoki. And unfortunately, we're going to have to cut this one a little bit short because uh, our next round, in fact, our last round of the day here is being paired, and uh, the players are going to be seated momentarily here. I can tell you that Aoki, well, you saw he won that game. He won the next one as well. We've got Rich and Maria at the news desk, but first, these messages. <laughs> 